Our first reading is from Genesis chapter 50, and this will serve as the sermon text. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. The word of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. When you have done something terrible to a friend, how do you get over that guilt? When someone else has done something terrible to you, How do you ever move past that? In the account of Joseph and his brothers, we learn that keeping score, trying to even things out with with justice, it's not the solution to guilt or grudges. The solution is something entirely unfair. Let's review the life of Joseph. Jacob's Joseph His father, Jacob, had 12 sons. But the clear favorite was the youngest at the time, uh, Joseph. To show how much he loved Joseph, he gave him this ornate coat, and it made the other brothers so jealous, they couldn't even say a kind word to Joseph. Well, the final straw came when Joseph had a dream about all of his brothers bowing down to him. And he he thought it would be a good idea, given the situation, to share that with his family. Well, the next time that the brothers were out working in the field and Joseph came by, the brothers seized him, threw him in a well, sold him to slave traders, and then told their father he had been ripped apart by wild animals. An Egyptian uh, official named Potiphar purchased Joseph. And Joseph was such a good worker that Potiphar made him his personal attendant and put him in charge of his entire household until Potiphar's wife accused him of sexual assault and had Joseph thrown into jail. In jail, Joseph was such a good worker that the warden placed him in charge of all the other prisoners. Everything that Joseph touched prospered. One day, the cupbearer of Pharaoh himself was, was thrown into the same jail, and Joseph was talking to him about this strange dream that the cupbearer had. Joseph interpreted it for him. He told him, in, in three days, Pharaoh is going to restore you to your position as cupbearer, and when he does, please remember me, because I did nothing to deserve to be in this prison. Well, sure enough, just as God revealed in the dream, the cupbearer was restored in three days and immediately forgot all about Joseph for two years, until Pharaoh had a strange dream that nobody could understand, and the cupbearer remembered that Hebrew's prisoner back in in jail two years ago. So Pharaoh had Joseph cleaned up and brought before him, and Joseph interpreted his dream. Pharaoh, very soon, Egypt is going to go through a period of great prosperity. For seven years, it's going to be like never before seen. But after that, there's going to be seven years of famine so bad that that those first seven years of prosperity, they're not even going to mean anything. So Pharaoh, here's what you need to do. You need to pick a wise man to oversee the collection and storage of grain during those seven good years so that you can distribute it during the bad years. And Pharaoh thought, you know, that's such a good idea. Joseph, you do it. He dressed Joseph in fine linen and gold and made him second in command of Egypt. Joseph went from favored son to slave to prisoner to ruler of Egypt. Well, 
just as God revealed in the dream. Those seven years of prosperity came, followed by the seven years of famine. And the famine was so bad that Jacob, all the way back in Canaan, had to send the brothers to Egypt just to find food. And when they arrived, Joseph saw them and recognized them immediately. They, of course, had no idea who this wealthy Egyptian man was. So Joseph kind of tested them to see, have they changed? He interrogated them about their family and their father. He accused them of being spies, threw one of them in jail, and sent the rest back to get this youngest brother named Benjamin. When they came back with Benjamin, Joseph threw him a feast And when they were leaving, he took his personal silver cup and hid it in Benjamin's bag, accused him of of stealing, and was going to make Benjamin his slave. Until Judah, one of the older brothers, stood up and said, No, take me instead. And then Joseph knew, yeah, the, the brothers had changed, and he couldn't contain himself anymore. He he broke down crying and said, It's me. I am Joseph, who you sold into slavery, but but don't be afraid and don't be angry at yourselves because God did this. God used this to preserve your lives. Go tell my father that I'm alive. Tell him to come to Egypt and he and his whole family can live here and I'll take care of you because there are five more years of famine left. Jacob and, and his whole family came to Egypt. Joseph took care of them. Everything was going wonderful. And then after several years, Jacob died. And we come to the dramatic conclusion of the life of Joseph in our text this morning. Jacob died and the brothers began to be afraid. What if if Joseph holds a grudge against us? What if he now pays us back for everything that we did to him? The brother's reaction is, it raises some questions. How, after all this time, could they not believe that Joseph forgave them? He forgave them the first time he revealed himself to them, before they even apologized, after everything had, that had been said and done, after all this time. How could they not trust him? Did their father really say, "Forgive jo- or Joseph, forgive your brothers? Or are the brothers manipulating Joseph. If they're just making this up, are they actually sorry for what they did or are they just afraid? And, and, you know, come to think of it, did the brothers ever apologize for what they did? Joseph was hurt. They didn't trust him. He, he, he broke down and wept. The reaction of the brothers, it raises some questions. But we are all too familiar with what they're feeling. Guilt. The last time that, that you really messed up and really hurt someone, have you gotten past that? Or does it intrude into your thoughts late at night what you did to them? Like, like some haunting you, like some terrifying ghost. If, and perhaps it's because yeah, we have such a hard time forgiving. And, and so these, these thoughts that, that I broke their trust, I hurt this person dear to me, those are hard sins to get over. How many times do they have to tell you, yes, I have forgiven you, I'm, I'm past it, I've gotten over it, it's okay, before you believe them, is it ever enough? And if it's because we have such a hard time forgiving others, you know, we try and put ourselves in their shoes. If I had done that to them, I wouldn't forgive me. I mean, if they had done that to me, I wouldn't forgive them. It feels good to hold a grudge, and it's so easy to do it. It it feels powerful to hold this wrong that they have done over their head. I, I don't want to let it go. I don't want to forgive. I am not going to forgive them until I know that they are truly sorry. Until they understand what I went through, then I'll forgive them. We we keep score. Do you see how truly evil sin is? The brothers sold Joseph into slavery, but 
but the sin and the damage run so much deeper than even that despicable crime. It had been over 30 years since that crime was committed, but, but sin is like a mold that seeps deep into the cracks of our hearts. 30 years later, the brothers were still anguishing in guilt and fear. After all this time, the family still hadn't healed, even though Joseph had said, don't be afraid, even though he said, don't, don't be angry with yourselves. Sin is a weight. Guilt and grudges are a burden. And only forgiveness can lift that weight off us. Forgiveness conquers guilt and grudges. The brothers, they came to Joseph thinking, we've got to do something to even the score. We sold him into slavery, so we'll, we will throw ourselves at his feet. And they said, we are your servants, Joseph. They thought maybe this was the only way to protect themselves. Joseph's dream, by the way, from all those many years ago was coming true. The brothers were here bowing before him, offering themselves as servants. And Joseph rejects their offer. You're not going to be my servants. You're my brothers. He, he forgives them all over again. He reassures them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? A um, Christian Syrian poet from the 4th century paraphrased Joseph's words as, do not be afraid of me, for although your father has died, the God of your father, on account of whom I will never strike you, is still alive. It was not Joseph's place to get justice. How could Joseph want revenge after all the good God had done for him? It wasn't Joseph's place to orchestrate and order history either. That was God's job too. Joseph's forgiveness came from his commitment to God. And Joseph had already fully and sincerely forgiven his brothers, so now his concern was for them. So though they didn't deserve it, he spoke kindly to them. He, he uh, said he would take care of them and, his family, and their families with many kind words, and he reassured them over and over. We know that we don't live in a fair world. It wasn't fair for Joseph to be thrown into prison. It wasn't fair for him to be sold into slavery. And so but we still think that everything has to uh, even out in the end. So we think that, well, my sins are so terrible, I will offer myself as a servant to them, and then they will forgive me, or maybe then they will even have to forgive me. We can hardly make up for our sins against one another, let alone our, our sins against God. It takes, it takes far more than us selling ourselves into servitude to uh, satisfy sin and remove it. It took God becoming a man, and shedding his blood to truly wash it away. Sin is a weight. Guilt is a burden. But Jesus takes that burden from us. He takes our sins and he puts them on his shoulders and he carries them to the cross. Jesus has uh, removed our transgressions and God no longer remembers them. Through faith in Christ, we have no sins left to feel guilty for. God doesn't keep score. He doesn't keep count of our wrongs. He doesn't make us pay him back. He cancels our debt, just like Jesus tells us in that parable in the gospel. Even though God has forgiven us, we have a hard time forgetting what we've done. We don't feel forgiven. I, I sometimes feel like I need to suffer for the sins that I have committed. But God cares about you. And God doesn't want you to be suffering for sins that Christ already suffered for. Your sins are already fully and sincerely forgiven. If, if God hadn't forgiven us, would he promise us that in baptism we are his own dear children? If he hadn't forgiven us, would he promise us that we've been given new birth? He reassures us again and again in his gospel. He speaks kindly to us. Jesus promises us. He, 
he ha- gives us his own true body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. Listen to what God's word says to you in 1 John chapter 3. This is how we set our hearts at rest in God's presence. If our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Are any of us in the place of God? It is God's decision who is guilty and who is innocent and God has decided, God has decreed that you are forgiven. Since God's forgiveness conquers our guilt, we follow God's example and we let his forgiveness conquer our grudges too. In the gospel, you are not treated fairly. We, we think that you know, we have to make up for sin. We have to pay our debt. But that's not how it works. God has canceled our debt. He's forgiven us. Our mind always goes back to there's got to be some aspect of fairness, but, but there isn't. Who would have thought that for all I deserve, my sins would end up on a cross? God, forgiveness conquers our guilt. And so, we offer to people something that is unfair as well. When somebody wrongs me, I don't give them the justice they deserve I forgive them because that's what God did for me. Am I in the place of God? I have no right to demand justice or or to hold a grudge. Joseph is a, a great example of that. Jesus is an even better example because not only is Jesus an example, he is our motivation, he is our reason. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It is hard to forgive just as Christ forgives. God has separated us from our sins as far as the east is from the west. God no longer remembers our sins. In Christ, it's as if we never even sinned against God. But when someone sins against me, even if I want to forgive them, it's hard to forget. Sometimes we we carry around the offenses of others like a an anchor chained around our neck, and it is a a heavy burden. I want to let it go, but how can I when what they did to me comes into my mind over and over again? Only the power of Christ can remove that burden from us. As human beings who have a hard time forgetting, the solution is to keep on forgiving. Say a, a brother or sister hurt you badly, and, and, and maybe what they did means that you're never going to be able to trust them quite the same way again. But you think about what God did, about how much he has forgiven you. And so you decide, I, I'm not going to hold this sin against them. I, I'm not going to seek revenge. You take a deep breath and, and you let that sin go. And a few hours later, the thoughts come back again and and the feelings come rushing back in again. And you are as upset with them as when they first sinned against you. What are you supposed to do? Forgive them in your heart again. And if in a day or two that those feelings come back again, forgive them again. And so on and so on. Just think how many times we go back to God again and again for for old sins and for new sins, we go back to God and he always forgives us. So we can forgive one another and and forgive again and again as often and as much as it takes. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if God has forgiven each one of you and if God has forgiven me, 
then we can be quick to forgive one another. And only the forgiveness of God can conquer our guilt and our grudges. And it does. Amen.